Well, good morning. Nobody is uh, attending live. Well, I feel alone. <laughs> but what are you going to do? I guess. So where were we? We were talking about effective listening. If the video serves me right from last Monday. Um, so let's continue with that. Um, and see where we go. Need to share. Need to share this. PowerPoint going. Okay. So We've talked about listening in general when someone's emotionally involved, or emotionally upset, that that's when you want to listen. But how do you listen to someone who is sharing a problem with you that you care about? You know, typically I ask somebody, you know, what do you do when your wife or husband or even your child or someone best friend is telling you a problem they're having. How do you listen to that? I'm look at that. So how do you listen when you listen to someone you care about? And And usually what they'll say is that they try to understand what they're going through or what their problem is and then give them advice or suggestions on how they might remedy the problem, which is, you know, I understand that it's well-intended and that, you know, but I don't know how appropriate that is um, because it's not your job to fix the other person's problems. It's not your responsibility to fix their problems because they're an adult. But that's usually what we've been taught to do. Um, make it better for them, if you can. So, it brings up, you know, a, a problem that, that I had when I was a kid once, that my mother was going through cancer treatment and recovery, and and she was falling apart. And I had never seen my mother fall apart before, at least from what I can remember back then. I was about 17 or 18. And I'd come home from school and she'd be crying a lot and upset. And it's like, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, this is my mother. I didn't know what how to handle this. No one taught me. And so I felt very uncomfortable. And I, it's like, I can't deal with this. So I said, you know, I... I, I I just would go hide, basically, is what I did in hindsight. I'd go in my room, close the door, turn up the music, and kind of like tune it out. So all I knew how to do in this situation. You know, obviously, I feel somewhat sad about that, that I wasn't be able to be there for my mother through that process um, like I would have now, you know, as an adult. But back then, you know, I didn't know. And so that's kind of how I dealt with things that were emotionally upsetting if someone was sharing it to me. Well, this didn't work <laughs> when I was like a therapist in training, when I was an intern. I mean, if I was seeing a woman and her husband left her and she'd come in and, you know, start crying, I, I didn't know, you know, here we go again. I didn't know what to do. Or if someone's, you know, loved one died. I don't know how to fix that can't fix that so I felt very awkward and very uncomfortable um, I can't say you know if you're gonna cry I gotta let you know I'm gonna leave you know, that that just wouldn't make it as a therapist I'm sure <laughs> no they wouldn't come back um, 
so I asked my supervisor, you know, about this. What what am I supposed to do when they start crying and they're all upset and I don't know what to do? And he said, you're not supposed to do anything, Dan. And I go, what do you mean? I got to make it better. Yeah, but you don't do anything. You just be there for him. And I looked at him and said, be there for him? What, what the hell does that mean? You know, it's like, that's what I... I mean, a cycle babble. I didn't know what they were talking about. Be there for them. <laughs> I'm here for you. But he was right. So I want you to learn how to be there for somebody if you're in that kind of context or that situation. Uh, I need to go back. I'm sorry to the drawing. So I learned an important thing here, um, two words that we're going to deal with again. Um, one of them is be, versus do. Two words. So normally most lots of people have the idea that if someone they care about is in distress or is having a problem or is upset, that they need to do something to better their situation. Okay. And, you know, well intended. Testing one, two, three, microphones are working. Test one, two, three. Yeah. I hope you can hear this. So do something. But what if you can't do something? Then you need to learn how to be there for someone. And the form of listening that I, you know, I taught the last time is the way to be there for someone. So if someone, you know, husband left her, you know, I would acknowledge what she's feeling. You know, you're really upset that, that he's gone and you're mad that he wasn't being faithful to you and you feel, you know, hurt by that. You feel very rejected. And I, I would keep acknowledging what the person's feeling for an hour in therapy. And then they'd say, well, I feel a lot better now, Dan. And they would leave. And I used to ask myself, well, what did I do? You know, I didn't do anything. I was there for them, which is doing a hell of a lot. I didn't have to take it on, which is what that implies that now I need to fix it. I can't fix it. It's not, but I definitely can be there in an emotionally supportive way. So this type of listening is the mechanics for emotional support. You know, people use that word a lot and they'll say, oh, I need you to be emotionally supportive. But what does that mean? How do you do that? Well, by verbally acknowledging the speaker's emotions and not talking about yourself is the way to do that. And, you know, and people say, well, God, I feel like I got a hundred pounds off my chest after talking to you. And I, you say, well, I didn't, what did I do again? You know, it's like, well, I acknowledged all their emotions. And when someone acknowledges another person's emotions, it's like, a, ah, they, they have a release and they feel heard and they feel listened to and supported. And of course, when you don't acknowledge how they feel emotionally, they have the opposite experience. So it's it's critical that we learn that we're not responsible for fixing other people's feel, emotions or, excuse me, problems. We're not responsible to do that. Unless it's a child. Now, if my daughters would tell me a problem they're having with somebody at school, then 
yeah, okay, you know, I'm your, I'm going to take responsibility and go f- see what I can do about it. So I go down to the school and and uh, talk to the principal and see what's going on. Get involved and be responsible because my daughters are having an issue. But I'm not going to go to the CEO of Wells Fargo Bank if my wife is unhappy about the way she's being treated at work. You know, it's like, well, okay, I'll go take talk to this person. No, it's not my job, not my responsibility. It's a, you know, she's an adult. She needs to take care of it. But that doesn't mean I can't be there again for her in, in terms of listening to her. So big difference between parenting and being an adult equal partner. So if someone is complaining or talking about a problem they're having, um, I would, the first thing I do is acknowledge and listen to them. And I could, you know, say, you know, I really see how upset you are by that. And it must be frustrating to have a, you know, supervisor who does that, or, you know, you're feeling really overwhelmed. And so after I've listened to her, let's say at night, you know, when I come home from work and she'll say, okay, I feel a lot better now. Let's go have dinner. I didn't fix. I didn't advise. I didn't do any of that. What I did do is provide emotional support. And that's the first thing you want to do. And that may be the only thing that you do, which is still a lot. Now, if they want, if my wife wants more than just emotional support, now, you know, she'll say, okay, you understand what I'm going through emotionally, Dan. What do you think I ought to do? Now, what do you think I ought to do is an adult soliciting advice. They're wanting my advice. They're asking for it. And if I have any, then I have a green light to give it. Um, but I'm still not responsible because I might say, well, I really don't know anything about that area. So you might talk to so-and-so, or maybe they know, but I, that's something beyond me. I don't know. It's, I'm not responsible again. I don't have to know, have all the answers. So it's still, but if they ask for it and I have it, I'll give it to them. Now, if you want to give advice and they didn't ask for it, after you've listened, then you always knock at the door first. Can I come in? You ask whether you can give advice. You always ask permission. Why? Because they're adults. You don't ever want to give adults unsolicited advice. Because when you do that, you're not respecting the adult boundary. You're just crashing right through. You're not You're not saying, you know, can I give you some suggestions on how you might handle this. Yes or no. See, if you don't ask that question, then you're just barging in. It's like your parents just come walking into your house without knocking at the door or, you know, calling first or anything. Just, hi, we're here. You know, that could be really embarrassing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Knock at the door before you come in. And they might say, sure. I love to hear what you have to say, Dan. Okay, and then I'll give it to them. Or they might say, no, I don't need any advice right now. I'm kind of overloaded, but thank you anyway. And they say, I don't want it. Walk away, you're done. But it's that question that's so critical because that's showing that you're respecting them as an adult. I don't know if you've ever had somebody, you know, just come up to you and start telling you how to run your life in whatever area. You know, they might have good intention and think it's helpful, but you're going to be pissed off because they're talking to you like, like you're a kid. Parents don't ask their kids if they want their advice. They give it to them. That's parenting. But to go up to another adult and do that, that's, that's not respectful. Okay? So I don't care what it is. I mean, I could have a, a doubles partner in tennis come up to me and say, Dan, you need to move more over here. And when that happens, you need to, it's like I start to say, are you the pro? I didn't. What are you doing? Tell me how to play tennis. Now, if they said, Dan, can I make a suggestion on how you might handle this better? I might be more open to it and say, yeah, sure. What What do you think? But if they just barge in and start telling me how to play tennis, I'm going to get pissed. And then it doesn't go well. And the defense, you see, well, I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to make it better for you. I know, but please ask permission first. 
So, anyway. Okay. So, if we think that we're supposed to fix people's problems that we care about, what what's another term for that in this class? You've already learned this. Well, it's called codependency. When you become responsible for fixing someone's problem, that's codependency. The opposite is not to be responsible. And this form of listening that we've been talking about, to me, is the antidote to codependency because it's a way to be present for somebody in a supportive way, but not taking it on as your problem, which would be codependency. So I can listen and acknowledge and support somebody emotionally and be there in that, that caring way, but I don't take it on as now it's my problem. People often ask me, how do you listen to people's problems all day? Isn't that, you know, heavy or you know, overwhelming or something? And I go, no, I'm not responsible for their lives. That, I'm not, that's not my job. I'm not responsible. So I don't get burned out because if I became responsible, I couldn't make it through the day. You know, it's like seven hours of listening to problems. Not, it's like, I would be a waste case. Okay. But if I can just listen and not take that on, then it's not so draining. It still takes work. It's still focusing. It's a challenge. But I don't carry it home with me. I'm not walking around thinking about their life and their problems. You know, I got my own stuff to deal with. So effectively listening is a way to be there without owning what's going on with the other person, which is codependency. Now, if you're trying to fix someone's problems, okay, what uh, what two levels are you going to focus on when you listen to them? I get a drawing up there. So there's, they're the sender, and they're talking to you. What what are they going to focus on? Remember, there's the content, and then there's emotions. So most fixer, fixer people always want to know the content. Give me the facts. Okay, but they're not listening to your emotions. Okay, they're not, they're not dealing with emotion. So, you know. Well, give me the facts and then spit it out. The solution. That's what doctors do. They they get when the symptoms first appear, how often you had them. You know, they're not they're not gonna want to tune in to what you're going through emotionally relative to your problem. Because their fear is if they open that door, you'll never leave their office. It's just become an emotional long thing. So give me the you know, give me the give me the facts, give me the symptoms, spit out solution. So as a result of that, the sender doesn't feel like you've listened, that you understand them because you haven't acknowledged how they feel. And they start looking at you as a, you know, cold hearted bastard because you're not, you know, you know, you don't care. And then the sad thing is in doctor with patients, the patients will go to another doctor because the one I have doesn't care. It's not necessarily true. They care, but they just come at it a different way. They're trying to fix it. But you got you can't fix it until you deal with the person's emotions, and then you can maybe fix it. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. So it's 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 emotion that matters, not content. Again, um. What else? If you're going to listen to someone, you need to want to do it. And what I mean by that is if you're like conflicted or distracted, you can't do this kind of listening. You have to be very focused. And if you're you're not, then it, it, it comes off like you don't care again. So 
you know, I used to, you know, listen to people's problems all day. When I came home, you know, I, the minute I got home, did I want to listen to how my, what my wife's experience was all day? Really not. I mean, not initially because I was tired and need something to eat, change my clothes, get a break. And so um, I used to think I should listen. Anyway, this is my wife. This is not a patient. So I'd kind of like, okay, tell me, uh, how was your day, honey? And, you know, and I'd start unconsciously a lot of times start fiddling with the mail or something. I wasn't paying attention. She could pick up on it. And she said, you don't care. You don't want to listen to me. And I go, oh, I want to listen. I do, I do, I do. But the truth was, I didn't. Not at that time. I need a break. So when I did listen, it, it, when I was conflicted, it came off half ass it came off like not sincere and she could sense it by my body language so i learned to say hey I, I would say i'd love to hear what happened to you today right now but right now i need something to eat i need to change my clothes get more relaxed i can really tune into what's happening in an hour can it wait and she says sure it can wait okay good and that way i when i did listen i was present i was not conflicted I really do want to know what happened. Just not the timing with them, right? Now, if it's a crisis, then okay, we, I would listen. But that was rare. I mean, that was an exception, not the rule. So to listen to someone in this manner that I'm talking about, where your focus is on them, you got to be really into doing it. Don't do it if you're not into it, because it comes across, across very insincere and not like you give a damn. Um, also, if you have something you want to talk about that's important to you and you're going to be open and you're going to be vulnerable and you're not just talking about the weather, you want to set it up before you do that. I call it set, have a meeting before the meeting and talk about, you know, that you got something you want to talk about that's important. So I just say, hey, honey, I really want to talk to you about something that's important to me. Is this a good time for you to listen to me? Are you willing to listen to me? And they'll say, no, this isn't a good time because I'm watching this program or blah, 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 whatever the reason is. And I say, okay, fine, I, I'll get back with you. If they say, yeah, this is a good time. Here, sign the contract, <laughs> provide services. They made a commitment to do the listening. And then if I start talking to them and they are getting reactive and defensive and argumentative or whatever, they're not listening. I'll say, I, you know, are you going to listen like you said you're going to do or not? What's it going to be? Because I don't want to talk to you about this if you're not going to listen. I'm clear about that. doesn't do any good to talk to somebody who doesn't want to listen to you. But that's a waste of your energy and time. But you can hold them accountable because they agreed up front by saying, yeah, I'll listen to you. But what this also avoids is what I call um, broadsiding somebody, just coming at them with something without any prep, without any agreements ahead of time, just bam. And usually when you do that, you're going to get a negative reaction from them. You're going to get caught off guard. I got someone hanging. So it's important, you know, to set that stage up before you just unload on somebody because you're going to get frustrated if, if they react in a negative way. Um, that's what happens in business. Business operates like that. They have a meeting before they have the real meeting. And then the first meeting, they talk about what they're going to say, how they're going to, what subjects they're going to cover, who's going to do what. They have a whole lot of preliminary before they just, then they have the important meeting. So set it up before you do it. That's the idea. Now, if it's just weather talk, you don't have to have a, this kind of stuff. This is like when you know you have a topic that's explosive or a person it's important to you to be heard. You want them to sign that contract and then you can hold them accountable. Hmm. Anything else? Hmm. I can't think of it. 
Okay. Now, we've talked mostly about listening to someone who's communicating verbally to you, which is probably the majority of time. But now I want to talk about how do you listen to someone who's nonverbal, who isn't using words. Well, it's, the process is the same, really. It's just it's different when they're not using words. So typically, um, if you see somebody, let's say I come home and my wife's giving me dirty looks and she's pouting and slams the door or something, you know. So typically when someone is kind of like <clears throat> not talking, you know, shut down like that, what is, what is the person who comes on then, onto them do when they see them? Know what they do? They say, what's the matter? What's the matter? Is something the matter? Did I do something that made you mad? What, something happened at work? They start bombarding them with all these questions. What's the matter? What's the cause? And what they're not doing, obviously to you now, I hope, is that when you come at them with all those questions, what are you not doing? that we've been talking about. Well, you're not acknowledging how they feel. You, you're like ignoring how they feel. And there's like a, a neon sign flashing out, I feel angry, I'm upset, I'm mad, I'm hurt, whatever. They're not saying that, but their body language, you know, the vibe is definitely saying something like that. So you make a guess about what you're feeling or what they're feeling, excuse me. And then you feed it back to see if maybe it's true. So you go, wow, you look like you're really upset about something. You know, you're, something's really making you mad. You want to talk about it? I'd like to hear. So when you acknowledge the emotion, they, whoa, that opens the door potentially. But if you say, what's the matter? They're going to go, fine, nothing. You know, they, the more you ask a nonverbal question, communicator questions, the more they shut down. And then you, you get really frustrated with that. I'm fine. Nothing. You know, tell me what you feel. You know, you get you can't, you don't like that. You can't do that. So the first step is to acknowledge what you think they're feeling and then to see if they're going to open up. If they open up and say, yeah, I am upset because let me tell you what happened today. Now they're talking on a verbal level and you just continue acknowledging what they're feeling. And they're opening up. Now, some people, instead of asking them what's the matter, what they do is they withdraw. They go, oh, I can't deal with that. <laughs> they go away. And that tells their partner that they don't care. And then that makes them hurt and upset. So whatever they were emotionally dealing with, now is compounded with the fact that they don't think you care. So there it escalates their behavior or, and how they feel. And then you withdraw more. Pretty soon you're not very close, major distance. So acknowledge how they feel. And then if they don't open up, then you can say, okay, well, I can see some, you seem to be upset about something. But if you don't want to talk about it, I'll be in the other room. And when you want to talk about it, let me know. Okay? Bye. Then it's incumbent on them to come to you to bring whatever is going on with them. Because you've invited them to open up. They're not taking it in the moment. So later, hopefully, they'll come. But you can't force it. Don't tell me what you're feeling. you got to talk to me. You know, you do that, and then it's just more of a power struggle. Who's in control? Open up. No, I'm not. Nothing. This goes on with teenagers a lot. Parents, that's, they do this. You know, what's, where, what's the matter with you? It's nothing. I'm fine. It, it's a game. But between lovers, it's not okay. Intimacy is totally trashed. Okay. I have a class of one life. No picture. 
I'm not alone. Oh, God, I got somebody. Good. I'm not alone talking to my computer. Do you have any questions? Can't hear you on mute. There Sorry. we go. No, not really. Okay, Just I noticed your haircut. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are you doing? It's hot. Yeah, I didn't want short. She needs it in the short. <laughs> anyway, it'll grow back. There's a lot of control before, but I like in the meal. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so that's listening. I hope that all of you practice it and been useful. So now we get to move on. Um, so now that you know how to send information and how to receive it, now we get one more topic to deal with, and that's conflict, how to resolve conflicts. I've alluded to conflict, but I haven't really talked about how to deal with it in a constructive way. So that's what I want to do now. Get that new PowerPoint up. Conflict resolution. So conflict resolution is, as I've said a bunch of times, normal. Or conflict is normal, not resolution. But if you're in a relationship with someone, you're going to have conflict. Those are the territory. And if you do not want conflict in your personal life, then I always say don't get married for sure and definitely don't live with somebody because it's gonna there's gonna be conflict. Not that that's a bad thing. It's just you not you you know, this goes with territory. You have two different individuals who come from different backgrounds, who have different family histories, different family models, cultural differences, personality differences. They're they're not you're not clones with somebody. And if there is no conflict, then you're looking at a relationship that has problems. This is a typo here. This should be deleted. I don't know why you don't delete that. Meaning if there's no conflict, that means that someone isn't that they're not into the truth. They're more operating at, you know, trying to maintain harmony all the time, keep the peace, the passive behavior. Don't rock the boat. So it looks like the relationship is doing well and everything's great, but it's not because it's not real. So when people brag to me about how they don't have any conflict, they get along on everything, I highly suspect that something's not right. Now, when most people hear the term conflict in relationship, they don't say conflict. What do they usually say? What in terms of what they do, like they fight or argue, yeah. right? The terms they use are fight. We fight a lot, or we argue. Um, those are ways to have conflict: fighting, arguing, but they're un, they're, they're not constructive. So conflict just means to me different. You have a difference of agenda, differences in the way you do things just different that's and that's normal but how you deal with those differences that's where the the issue comes in the procedure how do you deal with the differences fighting is one way to deal with differences it's an ugly non-productive way but that's a, that's a lot of what people do so when i'm going to go through what i'm going to go through with you is what i call the process or the procedure on how to deal with conflict. Okay, and there's procedure and then there's con there's a subject. So 
when people talk about the causes of divorce, usually they'll say money, um, sex, disciplining children, dealing with in-laws, whatever. Those are the topics. To me, it's not, those aren't the issue. The issue is how do you deal with the difference? And so I, I want you to have a procedure and then you plug in a, a subject that you can handle constructively. Normally, you, a couple doesn't have any real healthy procedure. They put in a t subject and then it blows up and it gets ugly because the format's not there. So process versus content. I'm in the process when it comes to conflict. Because there's always going to be subjects. There's always going to be things that people are going to have conflict about. But how do they deal with that conflict can be consistent. That's what I'm looking for here. So whatever conflict you have, you can handle it because you have a good procedure. Most people have no procedure or very non-productive one like arguing. Right. So when it comes to conflict, there's there's two general types. Um, one type is what I um, what I call uh, what am I trying to say? The conflict of agenda. Two different I wants. One person wants one thing, one person wants another. From kind of minor things to major things. Like what kind of house do you want? What, where do you want to live? Um, what do you want for dinner? <laughs> the different degrees. It's, but it's conflict of agenda. Where you go, where do you want to go for a vacation? That's one type. Another type of conflict is what a person does. Their behavior can cause conflict and it causes upset and resentment the way they act. And those can be very little behavioral problems or really big ones. There's a whole spectrum there. So I want to take on conflict of agenda first. We'll talk about that. Um, what Americans like to do with conflict in general? What would you say about us as a culture? What is it no? like to do? Huh? What was the first part of the question? How do we like to deal with conflict? What's our way of dealing with it? What would we oh, like to do? We ignore it or we yell a lot about it. And if what's the intent of the yelling? What's the tenant of yelling? Um, yeah. Like if you're loud enough, then you'll be heard. Okay. Well, that's true. <laughs> um, our intent is to win. Yeah. We like to win things. We like to win football games. We like to win elections. We like to win wars. We like to win debates. We like to win. So what that does is it sets up what's called an adversarial arrangement. We like to win. So that means the other person loses. So that's called the win-lose situation. So when I go out to play tennis, I go out to win. I, I'm into winning. I don't want to lose. I don't go out to lose. I go out to win. And if the other person is upset that they lost, I don't care. Too bad. It's 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 adversarial. It's it's competitive. If I was a lawyer, I'd try to win the case, not out to lose. Okay, so that's very adversarial. And in those contexts, I, it's it's kind of okay because I'm not intimately involved with the person. It's just you know, game or whatever it is, a football game or something. But when that mindset of win-lose infiltrates an intimate lover-marriage relationship where one person wins and the other person loses or thinks that they lost, then what happens? Everybody loses. You cannot be adversaries in that way with a lover because if it's your lover they're on your team they're your partners you're together you're not 
you know, too bad, you lost, go home. You know, you go to bed together. And if you're bringing in that resentment from losing into the bedroom, forget it, ain't happening. So to me to say, you know, you can be adversaries and lovers, it just it doesn't go together. I always tell people, if you want to be adversaries where one wins and one loses, save it for divorce, because that's where you're going to end up and you pay money to do it. And, and that, even in that case, everybody loses in, the, you know, in some way. So no adversarial mindset. What you have to have is what I call a win-win approach with no one losing at the table, uh, negotiating at the table. No one walks away like they lost. If they feel that way, it's whatever you did is not effective. Now, you're not going to get everything you want, but you're not going to, you know, you're not going to feel like you lost. What do you think the payoff is of, of having, of living where you have this kind of, you know, win-win thing? Not 100%. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say that you're probably happier. <laughs> Why? What makes you happier? Because you're not getting everything you want, so it's. Well, yeah, you're not getting everything you want, but it's better than like not getting anything that you want, or your partner not getting anything that they want. Like, mm -hmm. it's nicer for both people, and you're probably more secure because you know that like wild stuff isn't going to be thrown around, and you're not going to like lose mm -hmm. everything if you're both like committed to right getting good. Stuff. So what I usually say, you know, because I can remember when I was single, not in a relationship, I could play tennis anytime I wanted to. I didn't have to run playing through the committee, I call it. Okay. I could play all day Sunday. I could play all day Saturday, whatever I wanted to do, if that was the case. But when I'm in a relationship, I can't play all day, do whatever, play all the time. I need to negotiate you know, to work it out with my wife to make sure she's okay with it. And she might have other plans for us. See what I'm saying? So when I was single and did it whenever I wanted to, yeah, I had the freedom to do that, but I was lonely. I didn't, wasn't feeling emotionally loved. I didn't, you know, a lot of downside to that. Couldn't, you know, tennis didn't do it on its own. So I always remember when I negotiate playing tennis with her that that's what, the payoff is that I'm in an intimate relationship because if you don't give a damn about intimacy and closeness and with a person then be single and you can do what you want when you want you don't have to negotiate anything there's no conflict in, in that sense but you need to remember that because a lot of people kind of get mad that they have they can't just do what they want to do well that's you can't do that in a partnership. That's what we're talking about. Partnership, not individual on your own. Now, uh, I think you said, how do people deal with this, you know, conflict typically? Well, they like to argue. They use what I call logical persuasion. Um, it's like they try to talk the other person out of what they want, telling them that what they want is not that good, but what you want, they, uh, much better. So they'll go, you know, what I want, a lot better. I talked to the neighbors. I talked to my friends. I looked it up on the internet, and it says what I want is a lot better than what you want. And then, of course, the other person is going to come back and say, no, it's not. Your friends don't know anything about it. How can you say that? And they argue and debate the validity of what each other wants until somebody goes, Okay, we'll do what you want. Does that make you happy? And in a sense, it's like you, you make a sale in getting what you want, but the, your partner isn't going to be happy about it. They're leaving the store mad. It's because they perceive that they lost. So if that's that debate argumentative thing. Now, if you have two adults, normally if they lived alone, 
they just go do what they want. They don't have to defend it. They don't have to explain it. They don't have to justify it. They don't have to do any of that. They want it. They go do it. That's okay. That's being an adult living alone. But just because you're in a relationship doesn't mean what you want, you have to sell. You have to argue the validity of it because, you know, it's valid as is. You want it? Okay. I, you know, that's not what I want, but it's you don't have to attack the other person's desire because, you know, if you weren't there, they would just go do it. So to me that debating and arguing who's right, who's who's better, what, you know, that's a waste of time. And you're not respecting the fact that the other person is a grown person, adult, who knows what they want. And it worked for them. It may not work for you, but it works for them. You get that? So you don't want to do that. <laughs> it's, it's like trying to win the argument. That, that is, yeah, you'll win the argument, but you're going to lose the customer because they're not going to be happy. Now, when it comes to this type of conflict, typically there's a couple styles um, on how they deal with it. So the first type of, of style is where they both people collude to keep the peace. I call it quiet death. They They avoid conflict to keep the peace. They don't want any conflict. So they avoid it. I call it quiet death because it, things look good on the surface, but it's not good because there's, there's no passion. There's no realism. You remember the harmony, um, yeah, the harmony versus truth. See, these people are in a total harmony, but nothing is truthful. So there's no realism, there's no passion, there's no emotion. And what do you think gets this couple to come into counseling or therapy typically? They don't fight. They don't come in saying, oh, we fight all the time. They have what, like a lot of resentment because they don't fight. And what, what do you think that symptomizes as? Um... They don't like talk to each other. They don't engage with each other. They don't have any intimacy. Last thing, they have zero sexual frequency. They maybe have sex once a month, once a year, very infrequent because of the resentment that you referred to totally kills their desire. So that's when they'll come in. Um, that's one type. Another type is what I call World War III, where they, the typical bickering, yelling, screaming, carrying on, loud, volatile, very intense drama, and lots of emotion going on. But over time, this type of interacting is uh, deadly to, to the relationship. They end up scarring each other, and they start becoming, you know, lack of any kind of this emotion, really, because they flatten out. Or they avoid each other because it's, it's not safe. So these are two classic patterns or ways that people have conflict. And they may have grown up in a family where there's a lot of yelling and screaming and fighting between their parents. So they go the other extreme, which is to avoid conflict at all costs. They don't want any part of that, which doesn't work. But I understand them choosing that. And then what I see probably more than any thing is where you have a couple that avoids conflict, keep the peace, don't rock the boat, and that can go on for about a month. And then all of a sudden, one weekend, something happens, and boom, they blow up and they have a big fight. And, they, you know, yell at each other and get all nasty. And then they go, oh, my God, we can't do that. You know, we can't operate like this. We're going to get divorced. And then they go back to being nice and do the avoiding thing. And they'll go on do that for a while. And then it blows up again. Pretty soon, by the time they usually seek help, they're having an upset blow up every weekend. The, 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 the frequency of that becomes greater until it's becoming like intolerable. So that's probably what I see the most, that flip pop, I call it.
the combination of the two. That's it. When it comes to conflict of agenda, this this is how most people have conflict. That's all we know. Most people, they don't know anything different. They, you know, they had parents that did the same thing and grandparents that did the same thing. And, you know, that's how they operate. And that to me is sad. That, that's sad that that's all our culture does to help us deal with conflict within an intimate context. And they, they used to get away with that because there was no divorce. So you were stuck. And so people learned to put up with it or something. I don't know. But today, you know, this inability to deal with conflict constructively, big ticket to why marriages don't stay together as long as they could because of this lack of ability on how to deal with conflict. So, but that's not going to happen to you. So let's move on. So what works? Well, let's talk about a few things first before we get to the what works part. Uh, stop sharing with that. So what works? Oh, wrong button. Okay, before we get into what works, I think there's some things you need to understand that is helpful. Um, because lots of people have asked me, how do I know how to do this? Where did I learn how to have conflict? Because my parents were no great example of it. Um, I didn't learn about anything about it in graduate school, which is amazing. You think about that. I'm being trained to be a marriage and therapist and they don't talk about conflict. They didn't. I learned most of what I, you know, got after graduate school. And one place where I learned a lot about conflict resolution was not from psychology, but from business. The business world deals with conflict so far superior than people do in their personal lives. It's incredible. But their motivation is not about being intimate and having great sex. Their motivation is what? Save money because lawsuits can be expensive. Going to court is expensive. So they wanna minimize that expense and they know that. So the different motivation, but the skill sets are still valuable. And there's no reason that they can't be used within a marital intimate lover relationship. So that's where I learned a lot and then applied it into this context. Now, one of the things that business does that I like a lot is that they structure conflict before they ever get into the business. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I've formed, uh, I've had at least a couple, a couple, a couple of business partnerships I've been a part of where I had a business partner and a counseling center, we were business partners. And when you have a business partnership, you have like 30 pages of legal statutes and agreements. It's a complex, it's a whole big thing. You know, who gets what, how do you get shared profits, all kinds of things like that. But the last clause in one of those agreements was um, when disputes arise between the parties, it will be handled through third-party arbitration. Now, that's significant. Why? Uh, because what they're acknowledging is, that, first of all, we're going to have disputes. When disputes arise, which means we're going to have conflict. So when conflict happens, this is our plan on how to deal with it. 
avoid going to court and have a third party arbitrator and to resolve it out of court. So that saves a lot of money right there. Sign here. Now, when a couple gets married, do they talk about when they get their wedding license or whatever, when they, do they say how they're going to handle disputes between the parties? No, they they don't. They don't even acknowledge that there's going to be disputes. They don't even want to do that. They're in like la la land. They're, they're not, we'll never fight. We love each other. We'll always get along. <laughs> At least in the first marriage. The second one, no, nah, they're not so naive. <laughs> so I like that idea. See, so they have a plan on how they're going to deal with conflict. So that's kind of how I would, you know, if I could have every couple do that. Have like, you know, a meeting about how they're going to proceed with conflicts and i don't care what the conflict is how to raise children where they're going to live you know I'll, that that's all secondary to me it's what's the procedure now in business they call it arbitration that's one form uh there's mediation arbitration collective bargaining bargaining there's all kinds of things like that those are structures that's what i mean by structure now, not too long ago, I had my own personal experience with conflict in the lawsuit. And that, you know, I never went through that before. And what happened was that I was in a lawsuit with the builders of my house because they screwed up on um, the way they graded the property and whatever, you know, and all that. But anyway, I was suing them for quite a bit of money. And um, so, you know, we did all the legal things. It took about two years. And then it came, finally it was our day in court after two years of all the preliminary shit. And then we get in the court and the judge goes, you know, they're saying that the statute of limitations have passed. This is, so you're out of here, basically threw it out because they didn't do it in a timely manner, the, our lawyers. And this is like, excuse me, all this for nothing. It's done. It's done. So I, you know, did not like that. So I sued the two lawyers we had for malpractice. You don't blow statutes when you're a lawyer. That's like given. And they just, oh, I didn't know. Blah, blah, blah. No, you're getting your ass sued. And I knew they had malpractice insurance. So we're going to get some money out of this deal. So they want so they wanted to do it and get it done with so they wanted to do what's called mediation not going in a courtroom mediation and i said okay yeah i want the money now i don't want to go through another two years of going through court so one day in san francisco we drive we go into the city we go up to the big high rise you know we go into this law office place and the lawyers we were suing were in one room with their representatives and their lawyers. And we went into another room with my lawyer, my wife and I, and we were in there. And so when it started, the mediator, there's one person that everybody says, okay, about neutral party comes in and says, he goes up to the whiteboard and writes down a figure on the wall. They're willing to give you this amount of money. I said, oh, really? That's ridiculous. And I blew up. And my lawyer said, no, Dan, it's going to be a long day. You need to chill. <laughs> you know, he takes me aside. Sit down. I will handle this. That's what, what I do. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so he said, no, we don't want that. That's not enough. We want this. And so we gave the guy the, the, the figure we want. So he goes back in 45 minutes later, comes back. And they go, no, nah, we're not giving you what you want. We'll give you a little bit more. So all day we went back and forth like that. We were up here in their, you know, what they call too much top. top and, and we called they were down here in the basement with what they're giving us, chump change. So by the end of the day, six o'clock at night, it became leveled out. And I said, okay, that works. I'll take that. And it was subtle. That's mediation. Did I get everything I wanted? No. 
but I wasn't what they wanted to give us. And we didn't have to argue, you know, just negotiate it. So that's what I mean by structure. See, because if we did that in one room, we'd be yelling at each other, I'm sure. And it would be a waste of time. So that's business. Now, as far as marriages go in the state of California, and other states are different, but in our state, we have what's called a community property state. And I find a lot of students, when I talk about what's community property state mean, they don't know. That's kind of shocking to me. Because what, you're going to find out after you get married? <laughs> no, hopefully not. Community property state means that whatever the couple has in terms of assets is equal. 50 50 and it doesn't matter who puts more money into the partnership it still comes down to 50 50 so if a man makes a hundred thousand dollars a year and contributes that to the the partnership and the wife only makes five thousand dollars a year guess what they still have 50 50. now in business it doesn't work like that whoever has more shares so to speak, in the in the business has more power and control. So that fries a lot of people's butts when they get divorced and they find out that they have to share their pension, the equity in the house and all these things equally, equally. Because it's like when the couple gets married, the state gives you each 50% stock in your marriage. Irregardless of money, just equal. That's community property. Now, anything generated financially before the marriage, that's not the case. That's the other person's. Unless they commingle it into the partnership. So 50-50 equals share. So what's the significance of that? No one's one up on the other one. No 60, 40, 70, no, equal. Then stock has to do with, you know, power. You know, it used to be that a woman didn't have anything. And so if her husband left her, she was out on the street. Not now. She's going to get half his pension, half his 401k or half of the equity in the house. That never was the way it was. So that's really radically changed things. But what I want, I'm not concerned about the money so much, but what I want you to get is how, how do you think a person's going to feel if they're one down in a marriage and not financially compensated for being one down, like if you're a worker or something? Well, you're going to resent the hell out of it going to feel ripped off and that resentment poisons the love between the couple because if you're one down you're going to resent your spouse at some level because they got something over you but you know people didn't give a damn back in the day they didn't care uh, now that resentment gets in the way it's like how can you love somebody like that it's like a dictator now, what happens in political science or when there's an oppressor and then you got the masses and the oppressor is like running the show? We got that going on right now. How how the how the people feel about it? They don't like it. They don't like it. And then what do they do about it? They rebel. They rebel, right. The overthrow is ever on top. What's going on, you know, in Ukraine, R Russia, Putin? I mean, he's a hell of a dictator. Uh, it went on in uh, Syria for how long? Same thing. They got that guy running the show there and that family and all the people, you know, rebelled, and destroyed their country in the process. And now, you know, it's starting to happen in, in like Iran. 
I mean, they've been, okay. And in my lifetime, I saw what was known as the Soviet Union fall apart. Never thought that would happen. They finally said, enough with this. Now, that's what happens in politics. What happens in a marriage? What does the overthrow the dictator look like? Divorce. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you you may resent having to share your, your money or your property or whatever, but the alternative is it's not going to work. And you're going to have somebody to kind of hate your guts because you're like the warden of the prison. And you're not going to feel too good about that. So if you don't want to share anything, don't get married again. You know, fine. Be alone. Okay. So what works in terms of dealing with conflict of agenda? So I'm going to lay the generic process out. And then, like I said, it's applicable to whatever the conflict's about. Now, typically, I usually say, you know, I, I'll pick a couple in class and I'll say, okay, you know, two people in class and I say, okay, you want to go to Hawaii for vacation and you want to go to Mexico, let's say. Now, if you're single, you just go do your thing. You know, you go to your respective places. There would not be any discussion, right? But you're in a partnership, so you can't just go unilaterally, go do what you want. That, that, that don't work <laughs> for sure. You understand that? It's always you go through the committee can't operate solo unless it's been agreed to. So the first step in a good conflict process is where both parties say what they want. And they realize that they got different de desires, Mexico, Hawaii. It doesn't matter. It could be uh, what kind of car you want as a couple. Uh, what kind of house you want. That's a big one. Um, goes on and on. Those are normal conflicts. So the first step is both people say exactly what they want. And no, I don't care, whatever you want, whatever makes you happy, none of that passive sellout stuff. Straight up, boom. The second step, um, I wouldn't write this down. You can read this in the book. Um, the second step is to achieve an emotional understanding of what each party wants. So um, it doesn't matter who goes first. Um, so I, let's say my wife wants to go to, her, to Mexico for vacation. So I would listen to her, listen in the way I taught you earlier about how she feels about going to Mexico. So I go, so it's really important to, for you to go there. You feel very relaxed. You really enjoy it being different than the United States. You enjoy the culture. Oh, yeah. Um, whatever she feels about going to Mexico. And I'm trying to acknowledge how she feels about it. And then when she's done expressing how she feels about it, where she, about Mexico, then it's my turn and I get to talk about going to Hawaii and she listens to me about going to Hawaii. You really enjoy it there, Dan. You feel, you know, you like it, the fact that you're comfortable because it's still in the United States, whatever. So one person talks and the other person listens. And then when the person who's talking is done, then the other person listens. The goal is for both parties to feel listened to and understood. Nothing about agreement, nothing about solutions, understood. So the listening that we talked about previously is really incredibly important in conflict resolution because that's not what people typically do at this stage. They do what we, you know, they argue. 
this is where the arguing starts. You know, oh, Mexico sucks. That's really not a safe place to go right now. You know, the cartels running around, you know, kidnapping people. You don't want to go to Mexico, do you? Do that. Yeah, I want to go. You know, they don't do that where we're where I want to go. And blah, blah, blah. And Hawaii is like overcrowded, expensive, you know, and then you get into a kind of a pissing match about who's things better. That's where most people go right here. Until somebody goes, okay, we'll do what you want then. <laughs> and then you're going to pay later plan. That's called play me. A lot of resentment. So what each party wants is, is legitimate as is. There's no attacking it, no putting it down. It's just that's what they want. And if, like I said, if you weren't, if they were alone, they just go do it. They wouldn't have to do this. They're single. Also, it is so much easier to resolve a conflict when both parties have been heard, heard, listened to, acknowledged. They don't need to yell and scream. They don't need to talk on and on about it. They've been listened to. They feel understood. It chills it out. But when they're not being listened to, then they turn up the volume and it escalates and it doesn't get resolved in a timely manner. It works. But the main thing is that this listening step takes the power struggle out of the conflict. There's none of this, who's going to get their way? Who's going to win? Who's going to dominate? There's none of that adversarial stuff. And it, it just works a hell of a lot better. So it's it's like when I talked about the mediator. See, I didn't, we didn't get engaged with the other party. We just, you know, it was like separated. We express what we want, why we want it. Then the guy would tell them and they come back. And it was very structured like that work. Okay. So you understand how each other feels. You understand where you want to go, what that's all about. You feel you've been heard. And also, I forgot this. When someone listens to you about what you want and you might get into giving more, you might go, you know, wow, I didn't owe men so much to you. I don't mind doing what you want to do now that I know how you feel about it. So it's easier to give if you choose that. You may not, but at least if you want to, you, you, you'll do it. So now how do you solve it? You understand each other. You've been heard. And now it's the solution time. Now, to me, the solution, what you're trying to do is find the thing that remedies the conflict to the best. Now, typically people use the word compromise at this step. We need to compromise, you ever hear that? So you know, what's compromise mean? See, because that can get dangerous. Because a lot of people's idea of compromise is I give up 50%. But see, you're going to resent that. See, compromise is, see, I want to make clear, is it compromise or is it sellout? So I don't sell out. It's not good. That's going to be resentment. Compromise to me just means you're going to come up with a solution where you don't get everything you want. But you're not angry about it. Now, if I'm trying to solve a conflict, or I, the best solution is where both people get exactly what they want. 100%, both sides. But that's not too realistic. That, that happened, you know. So maybe I'll get 80% of what I want. Maybe 50% of what I want. But whatever solution that is reached, both parties feel okay about it. Not thrilled necessarily, but okay. No one walks away from that negotiating that settlement resentful. If either party has resentment about it, it's no good. Throw it out. You can't have win-lose. Both people have to feel okay about it. And I, ideally, you try to find the optimum okay solution. I think in the book, it says one person wants steak for dinner, another one wants spaghetti. So... You go to a place that serves both. Everybody wins there. You know, it's simplistic. But it's the idea. 
Now that could take 10 minutes to come up with a solution that works like that for a couple. It may take three weeks, but there's no moving forward or resolution until both parties can say, okay, I, that works for me. And if it works for both, then you're done. Not works for me, but it doesn't work for you, then throw that out. I don't want that. And that can be frustrating because, you know, like if I was looking for a house as a couple to buy, and I love this house. Let me tell you, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm all excited about it. And she, no, I don't like the fact that it's on a hill. You know, that that doesn't work for me. I, what, what difference does that make? You know, I could get all mad and argue. I said, okay, then we're not buying this house because I don't, as much as I love it, if we buy it and you don't like that, I'm going to hear about it, and I'm going to hear about it, and I'm going to hear about it, and I want that. I want you to feel excited about the house just as much as I am. So we go back and look for houses again, and it takes time. But I'm not going to win, and she loses. That's no, you got to get that, because you're going to pay later, and you know what that means. It means divorce. It means cold, turned off, angry. You don't want that. Nothing is worth that. Unless that's what you want, divorce. So bottom line is, are you comfortable? Yes. Are you? Yeah, that works. Good. We're done. Now, there's some conflicts that can't be resolved like that. Um, because sometimes you can't find a solution where both are okay about it. And sometimes you might need to give if you can't. But giving means without resentment again. That's not a gift if you're resenting it. All right, I'll do what you want, but I'm resenting it. Uh, that's not a gift. That's not giving. That's very expensive. So that's not what I mean. I mean, where you truly don't mind giving and not getting what you want. And then there's some conflicts that are non-resolvable. Divorce. Um, no way No way to find a solution. Um, one common one I had a lot, not a lot, but occasionally was where one couple wants a kid and the other one doesn't. And where that usually happened was with an older guy with a younger woman and they're in love and he had a vasectomy and she wants to have a kid. And he said, you know, oh, I'm not going to have a kid. And, you know, how do you cut a deal on that? That it, you know, it's not going to work. So, one wants a baby, one doesn't. I don't know how to resolve that. Sometimes, um, you know, what would be another one? Born, you have a born again Christian who's like fanatic about the religion. The other person is not into it at all. That's not compatible. That's not going to work. Um, or one wants to live in the country, and the other one wants to live in the city. You know, not going to work. You can't find a middle ground on that. So there are a few that, you know, you can't resolve this way. But the majority of them are definitely resolvable if people are open to negotiating and not into winning. You got to let go of that winning mentality idea. And that's where people have our time. And they don't see the, the benefit of compromise because they think I should get what I want. Yeah, but you're going to lose intimacy. If, uh, No losers, as I like to say. Okay. What time is it? Wow, it's already 12.30. Okay. That's a good place. So next time, I'm going to talk about how to resolve conflict of behavior. We just did agenda, desire. Then we're going to talk about how to resolve conflicts of behavior okay any questions no have a great weekend we'll see you next time oh i forgot <laughs> um let's see how do i want to do it i think i'll just send you the link it's easier i'll do that it's called uh it's not about the nail it's about two minutes it's a video, so I'll send it to you. Have fun. Talk to you later.
Bye-bye.